Brazil is by far the largest country in South America, encompassing a huge variety of habitats. The northern states in particular are dominated by one enormous ecosystem, the famous Amazon rainforest. Despite huge reductions in recent years, it still covers around 5.5 million square kilometres, of which nearly 60% is within Brazil. One of the most accessible areas of rainforest lies north of the town of Alta Floresta, in the southern part of the Amazon Basin, where we spent two weeks in September and October 2018. After a long journey from the UK, our last flight was to Alta Floresta from Chiaba, taking us across what was once ancient forest, sadly now converted to agriculture. On arrival at the airport, we were met by Brad Davis, a Canadian expat, now one of Brazil's top birding guides, who proved a great companion during our time in the Amazon. We were heading first to Taimasu Lodge, situated northwest of Alta Floresta and requiring a crossing of the Teles Perez River, one of the Amazon River's tributaries. From there, we drove on past more enormous cattle ranches, before finally reaching the lodge. One of the region's newest birding destinations, and wonderfully situated on the banks of the beautiful Rio São Benedito. The foreshore here hosted a resident flock of Muscovy ducks. Most were males. They have a metallic sheen to their upper parts, a short crest, and most noticeably, red caruncles dotted around black bare skin on the face. Females are appreciably smaller and lack the facial caruncles. They also have less white in the wing, as seen with this female on the left. The rocks were also favoured by a few southern lapwings. They regularly took time out here to preen and rest. The smaller and daintier pied lapwing was seen here too. And a lone black skimmer made a brief visit. Snowy egrets often foraged around pools near the rapids. They used their feet to disturb small fish and crustaceans from the shallow margins. Preening in trees by the river was this rufescent tiger heron. The tiger striped plumage aged it as a juvenile. They can be very hard to distinguish from fasciated tiger herons at this age. However, that species prefers higher altitudes and is highly unlikely to be seen in the Amazon region. Rufescent also tends to have a sturdier and more dagger-shaped bill. The 
the pools along the shoreline were also a good spot to bathe. Attracting, amongst others, these immature red-capped cardinals. And a great kiskadee. The smaller, lesser kiskadee was also here, using the rocks to search for insects. Back at the lodge, rainwater puddles attracted a myriad of butterflies. The majority were pale sulphurs, along with great orange tips, plus common sword tails. And this single king page swallowtail. As expected, a good range of bird species also inhabited the lodge grounds. Like this red-throated piping guan, feeding on palm fruits. This is the southwestern form, which has more white in the wing than the nominate subspecies, along with a much whiter crest. A female lineated woodpecker also put on a good show. A black forehead and lack of red in the malar distinguish it from a male. Nearby, a giant cowbird. As the name suggests, this is the largest member of the cowbird family. And the much smaller, shiny cowbird. Smart red breasted meadow larks frequented the rough lawns. They are sometimes called red-breasted blackbirds, but are now considered to be a small meadowlark, although closely related to other American blackbirds. Only the males have the scarlet breast. Females are duller, although the red developing on this individual suggests it's probably a young male. This is a more typical female. Also feeding on the lawns were flocks of blue-black grasquits. Like these, mostly females and immature males. The young males are very distinctive, with patches of adult iridescent plumage developing through brown juvenile tones. Nesting around the buildings were grey-breasted martins. Large tyrant flycatchers included another great kiskadee. And a particularly approachable tropical kingbird. This is the default kingbird of the neotropical region. Note the grey tone to the throat. Different to this much scarcer white-throated kingbird. A piratic flycatcher was regularly seen. The name relates to its behaviour of usurping the nests of other species, never constructing its own. It was very vocal.
Another flycatcher was this yellow-crowned terannulate. Around more open terrain was a swallow-winged puffbird. Small flocks of dusky-billed parrotlets sometimes visited. The dark upper mandible is the best feature to separate them from blue-winged parrotlets that occur further south and east. Spotted toady flycatchers had nested near the main house. This one appeared to be a juvenile. Tanagers included silver beaked, this being a male. plus a small flock of multicoloured turquoise tanagers. And swallow tanagers. Here were the tropical kingbird and a fork-tailed flycatcher. A brief appearance by a female spangled katinga was unexpected. A male rufous-tailed jacamar was seen at a secluded pond near the lodge's boat jetty. Only the underside of the tail is rufous. Along with a male Amazonian streaked ant wren. This capybara was resting in the same pond. Early each morning, a South American tapir would come to feed on scraps, specifically left for it at the back of the restaurant. It just shows how regular access to food in a safe environment can tempt the wariest of creatures. This was also the best time to see a family of bare-faced curassows that had nested in the grounds. We explored along the lodge's approach road on our first morning excursion. A pair of white-throated or cuvier's toucans appeared in the post-dawn gloom. and an Amazonian pygmy owl was perched in roadside trees. Smaller than the familiar ferruginous pygmy owl and with white spotting on a greyer head. It was briefly mobbed by a black-eared fairy. A singing white lord terannulate. plus a larger variegated flycatcher, looking around for passing insects. Also perched in full view was a male blue-crowned trogon. A white band across the breast is variable, and this one showed none at all. Further on the road were a pair of scarlet macaws. Usually the noisiest birds in the forests, but here relatively quiet as they fed together.
As the light improved, a chestnut-crowned Beckard put in an appearance. One of three. Followed by a male, scaly-breasted woodpecker. Females lack the red face patch. A paradise jacamar was picked up perched in branches just protruding from the canopy of roadside trees. And finally, a fairly obliging grey-lined hawk. Most authorities now split them from grey hawk, a species now restricted to Central America. From the road, we ventured along the bamboo trail. Appropriately enough, it has some extensive stands of bamboo, although apparently somewhat past their best. It's nonetheless still good for ant birds. One of the first to show was a male black faced ant bird. Then a male white browed ant bird. A Spix's warbling ant bird was much more difficult to see. As was a dot winged ant wren. And a brief dusky tailed flatbill. Thankfully, a male bar breasted piculot was more cooperative. In the afternoon, we took our first excursion along the river, heading east upstream of the lodge. We investigated a small tributary, where there were more muscovy ducks and the water was crystal clear. Hoatzins were easily seen in the trees lining the river. A unique species with an ancient heritage. Apparently they have an unpleasant smell, hence their alternative name of stink bird. Further on the river is an oxbow lake. Here a pale rumped swift was picked out from amongst the more numerous grey rumped swifts overhead. In the trees fringing the lake were a few black capped donocobius. pair of lesser kiskadees. And a female anhinga. Too soon it was time to head back to the lodge. Finding a speckled chachalaka en route. 
probably getting ready to roost. As opposed to this bat falcon, which was getting ready for its prey to emerge. They feed mainly at dawn and dusk, and are mainly aerial predators, taking small birds as well as bats. Close to the lodge, the old airfield track provides easy access to an area of white sand habitat. Unfortunately, our early morning visit coincided with a period of light drizzle. Good birds were still to be found though, starting with this male short-billed honeycreeper. One of a pair, ousted by a male silver-beaked tanager, and here a female lacking the silver patch on the lower mandible. In the same area was a variegated flycatcher. And further along the track, one of a number of rather soggy swallow-winged puffbirds. An unfilmable bald parrot flew over as the drizzle finally eased. A perched spotted pup bird was however much more accommodating. As was a female green-backed trogon, calling to a nearby male. and a lone black-billed thrush. Then on our return to the lodge, a trio of undulated tinamous were a surprise find as they wandered along the track. Out on the river again, the rain had returned. The rest of the morning to early afternoon, were spent on the north shore of the river, along the Agua Limpa Trail. One of the first birds seen was a straight-billed woodcreeper, typically working up a tree close to the track. Soon followed by a diminutive ruddy-tailed flycatcher. Ant shrikes included this male Amazonian. Plus a male dot winged ant bird. Back on the river was a female sun grebe. After a late lunch and a short rest, we spent late afternoon around the ranches by the lodge's entrance gate. A crab-eating fox wandering down the track seemed quite surprised to see us. Close by, a lesser kiskadee was searching for nesting material. As afternoon turned to evening, various parrots began to arrive. Some of the first were chestnut-fronted macaws, 
The name refers to a small maroon patch on the forehead. Like most macaws, they were quite chatty. Soon joined by orange-winged parrots. At dusk, plumbeous kites assembled to roost. Some still hunting flying insects. Waiting until nightfall, we managed to locate a calling tawny-bellied screech owl. And then even more impressively, a magnificent pair of crested owls. Their crests are actually long white eyebrow feathers. They were constantly calling to each other. Our last morning was spent at the lodge's canopy tower. It took a while for a mist to lift, but once it did, some views of the bird life here were superb. Like of this male Amazonian trogon. and a male rufous-bellied euphonia. Despite the name, the underparts are more golden orange than they are rufous. Up to three dusky-chested flycatchers were visible in the canopy. and a lovely pair of black girdled barbets were also on show. In one of the trees right next to the tower was a white-necked puffbird. A black-bellied cuckoo was a little lower down. Roving flocks of arasaris moved through the canopy. The majority were curl-crested arasaris. Even by the standards of this highly attractive genus, they are one of the most spectacular. There is no single curl crest but rather a series of shiny black curled feathers. Some chestnut-eared arasaris and a quite stunning male Gould's toucanet. Later, scarlet macaws joined in on the action. They were tempted here by an array of large seed pods.
As the morning warmed up, a huge flock of white-coloured swifts gathered above the surrounding forest. Tough birds to film as they careered overhead. After a few hours, it was time to descend to the forest floor and spend some time along the Barrero Trail. Here, Helenor Morphos enjoyed the dappled sunlight. More spectacular when their wings were spread. On the forest floor, there were plenty of strange towers created by cicada nymphs. Some had emerged, and only then was it possible to establish how deep they go underground. We also came across this large and very peculiar looking spiny weevil. not the most adept climber. Like many Amazonian trails, the birding was sporadically fabulous, but much remained out of camera range. Luckily, this male pavonine quetzal did linger long enough to be filmed. It was nonetheless very mobile. A pair of flame-crested tanagers were also here. This is the male. And here the browner female. Plus a scarce grey morph bright-rumped Attila. And finally, a helmeted pygmy tyrant. Rather unexpectedly, it showed extremely well, and we were even treated to the rare sighting of its erect crest. All too soon, it was time to leave Taimatsu. In hindsight, three nights wasn't nearly enough to explore what seems destined to become one of the region's top birding lodges.